It's, uh, it's one o'clock, and uh, I suppose we should go ahead and get started. I want to first of all thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's, uh, it's Women's History Month, and Mitchell Smith was nice enough to ask me if I might uh, have something that I would like to share in celebration of Women's History Month. And uh, this presentation came rather quickly to mind. I will tell you a little bit about how this came into existence before we get into it. Um, about 11 years ago, I was living a little bit farther south than I live now, and I was having a very, very uh, harsh life experience. I, uh, I lived in a state in which it became rather, rather obvious that everything that I could aspire to be was in some way shaped by my ethnicity which uh, embittered me quite a bit, I must admit. And uh, I came home uh, from work one day, having a, a master's degree, no police record, and still unable to find any kind of employment other than working as a manual laborer. And uh, was sitting on the couch very, very angry at the world. And I uh, realized that the Statue of Liberty had in some ways lost its meaning which was kind of disturbing. Uh, in the midst of all that self-pity, uh, my eight-year-old daughter came rushing into the house with a kitten she had found somewhere out in the woods. And it dawned on me that as hard as my life was to me at that time, for her life was going to be even more complicated, even more interesting, because she would perhaps have to fight if things did not change. She would have to struggle both with ethnicity and gender. And um, it troubled me for quite some time, and I couldn't figure out how to respond to it until um, several months later, I turned on the evening news and I watched this uh, then prominent politician, a man named Gingrich. <laughs> Mr. Newt was talking about women, women in the military to be specific, and what women could not do. And once again, I'm thinking of my child, and it dawns on me. Ideas like this will probably come into your reality frequently. People will constantly tell you what you cannot do. They'll tell you about your weakness. So this project began as, uh, as a father's attempt to find a way to say to a daughter who would at some point leave his, his kid, uh, you can, uh, you can be what you choose to be, even if you have to fight for it. And this led me uh, to uh, research more thoroughly a topic that I've been interested in for some years. Before I go any further, I must warn you, the numbers will become mind-boggling at a point. The stories are not all pretty. The slide presentation will focus on uh, the more prominent individuals that I've been able to locate and identify over uh, almost 10 years. And uh, I have um, I've brought with me uh, the working copy of the, uh, 
collection of poems that I did for my daughter. And uh, from that, I will share with you some of the stories of some of the, of the lesser known individuals. So without further ado, the figure that you're looking at stands on, uh, on a hill just outside of the uh, city that is currently called Volgograd. At the time uh, that we will be looking at, the city was known as Stalingrad. It was a city of some 500,000. It was an industrial location, uh, the best known for its foundry and uh, the Barricade Tractor Factory. Did I say that right? Okay. Um, Stalingrad is called by some historians the hinge of fate. This is where, arguably, the course of the Second World War turned. It is, to me, very interesting in that uh, this is also the first major battlefield on which the uh, presence of, uh, of the female as a combatant becomes overwhelmingly clear. Um, let's talk about women in combat for just a minute. I had to put on my eyes now so I can see. Let's talk about women in combat. First of all, let's take a closer look at uh, this, this figure. This figure stunned me the first time I saw it because uh, of the motion that is built into the structure. The hill is 332 feet high. It's the only high ground for many, many miles. It stands directly above the boulder. From the top of this crest, one can uh, command uh, hundreds of miles. She, uh, if I had a close-up of her face, you can see that her lips are, are false and it's stated as if she is in mid-cry or mid-scream or mid howl The sword is uh, lifted uh, very threateningly. I believe she is uh, 90 meters tall. So she's a 90 meter tall structure standing on top of the 336 foot high, high point on the Russian plains, or the steppes as they are called. Women combatants are not new to, to, to human psychology, to human uh, uh, mythology even. This is an image of uh, the Valkyrie from Norse mythology. They date back to uh, probably, I think, the earliest of the, of the Eras is of about 1,500. Unless I'm mistaken, it, uh, Norse mythology is not actually my, my area of expertise. This one is a little bit more uh, well known to some of us. There's a St. John Catholic Church out on uh, Highway 17 as one goes towards Gloucester. This is uh, the daughter of, of Jacques Doc. This is Jean Doc, uh, 17 years old at the time that she is burned at the stake on May 30th of uh, 1431. Joan has been uh, judged a heretic for many reasons. Among them, she, uh, she was manly. She dressed as a man. She cut her hair short like a man. She participated in battle. All of these things uh, being heresy at the time. So uh, Joan is now the uh, patron saint for, among other things, women in the military. Now, we start going into combat. Let me tell you what, what happened in the Second World War. Adolf Hitler co conquers a good portion of Europe in a matter of months. He sends a, a formation known as Sixth Army against a nation known as France, Jones Nation. In 28 days, they conquer France and stun the entire world. Things are going well. But the right has certain weaknesses. Weakness one, raw material, principally oil. Two opportunities, the Middle East negated due to Rommel's failure in North Africa. Second option, the Caucasus region. In order to reach it, you have to clip off and hold a good section of what was then the Soviet Union. Hitler launches what is called Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. 
in the initial stages in the first two days. Uh, the largest air force on earth is the Russian Air Force. It is huge in number, but most of its aircraft are obsolete. Joseph Stalin has been given a place by Adolf Hitler that he will not attack Russia. So even when Stalin's uh, sentries and his border personnel, his frontier forces, began to report that the invasion is underway, Stalin cannot believe it. In fact, historians say that uh, as it becomes clear to him that this is actually happening, he has a nervous breakdown. He does not respond. The outcome of this is the whole of the uh, Soviet Air Force is destroyed. Most of it is still on the ground. German mechanized forces roll into the Soviet Union and uh, destroy most of the formations they encounter, capture millions of Russian soldiers. The Crimea is the first area of combat. This young woman is Nina Onilova. We would say Onilova. Nina Onilova is, uh, is someone whose image I have seen for a great many years. Christina helped me to identify her just rather recently. I must admit that I am having trouble finding the specifics on her life. All I, I can say for certain of this individual is that she was what was known as a machine gun. In uh, the few translated documents that I can find in which she is mentioned, there's no great detail given on her, beyond to say that she is considered to be legendary, which I find interesting. If she is legendary, then uh, what you are about to encounter is breathtaking. German army on the advance. Notice the scorched earth in the background. This is uh, this is a rifle. This is not just a rifle. This is a rifle that has a history. Its history is linked to a particular individual. The United States Marine Corps boasts one legendary sniper. His name was Gunny Carlos Hathcock. Gunny Hathcock is a Virginia Beach, Virginia native. Gunny Hathcock served in the Vietnam War. He did three tours in Vietnam. He had, snipers call it a tally. In three one-year tours in Vietnam, Gunny Hathcock has a tally of 93 confirmed kills. For years, he was considered to be the premier American sniper. Rather recently, another man has emerged. His name is Chuck McWhinney. Mr. McWhinney is a uh, US Army sniper. There's always been a competition between the Marine Corps and the Army. Mr. McWhinney has a combat history that is 16 months long in Vietnam. In those 16 months, Mr. McWhinney has a kill tally of 103 confirmed. Low in the picture, there is an image of a woman laying against the brush with camouflage clothing on. I took that shot off of a collage that hangs in my office because of the fact that it's possible to lose her in the clutter of that collage. Her name is Ludmila Pavlodinchenko. Pavlodinchenko. Ludmila Pavlodinchenko walks into a uh, Soviet recruiting office at the age of 24. She is a uh, student at Kiev State University. Her major is history. She walks into the recruiting office. She is fashionably dressed. Her hair has been done very professionally. Her hands have been manicured. Her face is beautifully made up with cosmetics. The recruiters begin to laugh. They think it's a joke. Someone's pulling their leg. They sent this fashion model in to enlist in the army. She persists in uh, attempting to enlist. They try and enlist her as a nurse, as a, uh, as a clerk, as a clerk. She insists that she wants to carry a rifle. The laughter is hysterical. Unfortunately,
unfortunately for German troops, she finally convinces the recruiters that she indeed wants to serve in the Russian army. She wants to serve in a combat capability. She is known to this day in Russian circles as man killer. She is one of the first masters of camouflage on the battlefield. She uh, has a complete combat history that is less than 10 months long. She, her first theater of operation is at the uh, Odessa site, the city of Odessa. She serves at Odessa for two and one half months. She is then transferred to another fierce environment. The city of Sevastopol is falling. One of the things that the German uh, high command has done is they've uh, mastered the use of heavy artillery to reduce fortified positions. Sevastopol was built as a fortress. It's been reduced in order to slow down the, the advance of the German forces inside the city. Russian high command sends in sniper teams. This one is sent in. She is wounded there in an artillery barrage, evacuated by submarine under special orders, and is taken out of service as a combatant and made an instructor. Ladies and gentlemen, in the first two and a half months that she is on the combat field at Odessa, that young woman's kill tally in two and a half months is 187. When they evacuate her from Sebastopol, wounded. Her record stands at 300 and So she clearly has earned the reputation that she carries. This is, among snipers, this is one of the man killers. But she's not alone in heroism. We, we don't spend much time talking about the partisan forces on the Eastern Front. This young woman is 17 years old. Her name is Zoya Kosmodianskaya. Zoya is a child who uh, is tasked with creating a diversion so that a partisan unit can carry off a major operation. Because of the terrain and because of the fact that you can't sneak up on partisans very easily using tanks and trucks, the Germans are relying heavily on horse-mounted troops. Kosmodianskaya sneaks into the German held territory and sets several of the stables there on fire, knowing that the Germans will rush to try and save the horses that they need for their patrols, and uh, in fact does create an effective diversion for the partisans. However, she is captured. She is sentenced by the German troops in the area to death by hanging. Her last words, we are told in historical sources as she walks up the gallows, are directed to her captors. You cannot hang all 90 million of us. It's an interesting statement, particularly if one keeps in mind that during the course of this war, Soviet casualties, Russian casualties, will number 20 million. In short, this nation will lose almost a fifth of its total population. Zoya is hung, is hanged. In punishment, the villages who uh, the Germans suspect of having supported the partisans are forced to allow the body to remain at the end of the road. It remains there until the rope due to weather and weight, disintegrates and snaps. A body falls into the frozen soil below. In order to further terrorize the population, the German command in the area decides that no, she still cannot be removed and given final honors. She is in fact still laying in the uh, now beginning to thaw earth when Russian forces retake the area. The next photo is a little bit disturbing. I will warn you in advance. 
That is what the Russians find. It's a gruesome process, but they, uh, they indeed photograph this young woman as she lays there. Put with it the small photograph that's in the corner, and they circulated this all over the countryside. Far from uh, the treatment of this young woman somehow curtailing partisan activities, the partisans, in response, not only step up their activity, but they become increasingly more brutal in their treatment of German personnel. Stalingrad. German forces reached the outskirts of Stalingrad in October. No, I get that back in August of 1942. Up until this point, no German formation has been successfully checked during this entire campaign. In fact, up until this point in the Second World War, no major engagement in which both German ground troops and air forces are engaged simultaneously has been checked. Nobody has stopped a German army rolling forward under air support. Has not been done. Stalingrad. This city bears the name of Joseph Stalin. I don't know if you know it, but Stalin was some sort of odd megalomaniac. The only thing probably similar to him in existence was uh, another odd megalomaniac named Adolf Hitler. The capture of this city would be strategically important. As they stand on the banks of the Volga, the, the German forces will control a huge chunk of Soviet terrain. The area that they will control will contain a majority of the Soviet population. It will contain 40% of Russia's iron ore, of its coal. It will contain a huge chunk of Russia's rail network. More importantly, the majority of Russia's ability to grow food to feed itself. The Stalingrad holdings will now be transferred firmly into German pain. If they take Stalingrad, they have just defeated Russia. This uh, Hitler's actual orders are now available. One can read through it, one has the stomach, and find out what Adolf Hitler said to his own troops. The orders for Stalingrad are stunning. Capture Stalingrad. Send the female population to Germany to serve the Reich as slave laborers and whores. Exterminate the men. So the young women that you are about to encounter from this point on are all directly linked to the Battle of Stalingrad. These are the individuals that Adolf Hitler would have had transported to German held territory to serve the right as slave laborers and as whores. This is what Stalingrad cost. This is only part. This is from the hill. This is from the mayor looking back down to the city in the deep background. Volga River beyond it. This frame is but a fraction of the cost. Maria Raskova is the central figure here. There are no really good shots of Ms. Raskova. She, she's, a, she's an easy one to learn about. She's a hard one to get a good picture of. Uh, Ms. Raskova is an experienced pilot, a very capable pilot. She and uh, two other Russian aviators have uh, made one of the longest uh, flights in human history. They've flown uh, all the way cr across what was then the, uh, the Soviet Union. Raskova is the force behind the organizing of three all-female air combat units that will be first deployed at Stalingrad. She herself attempts to deploy to Stalingrad, but in bad weather and under fire, she crashes before she can get safely onto the ground. The 
rest of her formation fared better, this shadowy figure is. This shadowy figure is uh, a modern rendition of someone who was lost in 1943. And when I say she was lost, I mean literally she was lost. She comes home to the stage of history in the Battle of Stalingrad. At the uh, Battle of Krakow, she goes just off the stage. No one actually knows what uh, her outcome is until 1987. These are the first female aces. You know what an ace is? In air-to-air -air combat, a pilot who uh, obtains five kills after air, air is given the designation, the, the distinction of ace. Uh, in the, uh, well, you are just in the left-hand foreground, there's a smallish figure. She's about five foot three. You can't tell from that. She's kind of, kind of absolutely. She's a, she's a Barbie doll. <laughs> the descriptions of her personality would remind one almost of a valley girl. At the time of this shot, she's about 21 years old. In the center is a far more serious uh, pilot. Quite often, a, a wingmate. Lidgak, Budenova, Kunetsova. And it's odd that, that I know as I say their names, you've probably never heard them before. Lidgak, Budenova, and Kunetsova standing side by side. Fascinating shot. There are two records on this particular theater of combat. In these competing records, Kuznetsova is the first female to achieve an air-to-air -air kill in human history. There's a competing record that says Lidgak made her first kill one day earlier, but it's not worth arguing about. The thing that's important is these are the first women who will gain the designation of AIDS, and here they are together in a single photograph. Now to give you a little bit of a sense of who they are individually. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I, I decided that you needed to know who this one is also. That's Claudia Terehova. She serves in the same unit. She's not as well known as her uh, as her sister pilots. Claudia is not uh, known as a dog pilot, which is which means that she's not someone who is is widely known as. Uh, as excelling in air-to-air -air combat. What she is known for, though, is if she could find a bomber, a large slow thing, she's fairly hard on it. She's the bomber killer. Uh, I cannot find her uh, biography, so I don't know exactly how old she is during this time. These are the uh, some of the lady fighters of the 586th Fighter Squadron, based at Stalingrad. Lillian Litgak and Mutnova will initially serve with these young women before being transferred out into male units. These young women are so effective in the air that uh, after they're being deployed at Stalingrad, the German high command, I call them Litgak's Tigers. The German high command, after encountering them for roughly two months, begins a process of scanning broadcast frequencies every day, attempting to find out where 586 is flying. If they can identify the sector that these women are in, they immediately issue orders to all German air crews. The orders are specific. Avoid deception. It is not a decision of courtesy. It's not chivalry. It's not because they don't want to kill girls. Tigers are tearing German Luftwaffe formations apart. And you must keep in mind, the Luftwaffe is considered in its day, at this point in the battle, the Luftwaffe is considered the first premier air force. After all, these are the supermen. These are the Iron Cross Eagles of the Nazi Masters. 
So Miss Chin Sky looks out of the air burning first, but not until she has knocked down two of the JU 88s and has damaged the third, so that it's say possibly a fourth. Miss Sky is down. I'm gonna just call it time. Tanya is down. Raisha is left in the air along with the remaining fight uh, bombs. She continues the attack. She destroys another two. And then she herself spins down into your on fire. Both women survive the engagement. Both women return to their units and are back in the air the very next day. In one of history's great mysteries, you do not find these women listed among uh, those who were awarded the Soviet Union's highest uh, combat distinction, which would be hero of the Soviet Union. This is Budenova. She is a hero of the Soviet Union. This is the last photograph that was taken of her shortly before her death. She is killed in air-to-air -air combat at the age of 22. At the time of her death, she uh, had some G-12 air-to-air -air kills. And so the, this, these histories are not necessarily pretty. This is Valentina uh, Skinner. This is Skinner is another little known uh, combat pilot, and she's little known because she does not have a high air to air kill. She is another of those who, in the southern body environment, would be best known as a bomb hunter. These are the night witches. Also come, they also come online in the Battle of Stalingrad. This is the 47th Guards Bomber Unit, later designated 48. Notice the aircraft in the background. I'll show you a better picture of it in a few minutes. This is going to release a movie called The Night Witches. It's based on this history. How many of you have seen Enemy at the Gate? Okay. If you've seen Enemy at the Gate, I'm going to warn you. Be a little bit skeptical when you see Night Witches. If you've seen Enemy at the Gate, you know it's not the moon at Stalagra. It's a movie that's uh, Valerie Vasily Zayetsev and Hans Torvald. Vasily Zayetsev, the Russian master sniper, is being hunted in the rubble of Stalingrad by the German master sniper Hans Torvald. The, this, is, this is actually historically quite accurate. They have a female figure in the movie, cute little girl. Uh, she plays one Kamiya Chernova. Chernova is now uh, if you go up on the internet and look at all these websites associated with the, with the movie, they say now that she wasn't really Russian, she was American. Okay, I, I researched it 10 years ago. She was Russian then. In fact, she was Russian assigned to uh, 284th Siberia. In the movie, the most exciting things you see her do is hold a, a little piece of mirror to blind the German sniper so the Russian sniper can try to kill him. And then there's that little scene down in some bunker somewhere where amidst all the filth and all the confusion of death and dying, they, she has this passionate love scene with the hero. In the movie, you never see a fire shot. The real Tania Chernobyl comes into Stalingrad 
in September. She comes across at the same time that uh, Brother Finstead's uh, 13th God comes across. Shalom's uh, 37th God and 284 Siberia all come across in the same general timeline. But this says guards will survive the whole battle. They'll come across 10,000 strong. At the end of the battle, there will be 300 of them left. Jolette's force, 37th guard, mixed gender formation, comes across 10,000 strong. They are thrown into the middle of Stalingrad, where the, Rus where the Russians are being pressured by massive formations of German armor. They don't have that many anti-tank weapons, so it's going to be human bodies against tanks. And this is where Sholov's formation, 10,000 strong, is deployed. They do stop the attack. And remember, we're talking about men and women in a combat formation. They do stop the attack. Eventually, they will not only stop it, they will begin to drive it back. They will finally force the Germans pretty much back to their jumping off point. Unfortunately, this will all be accomplished in 48 hours. On the third day of their deployment, General Zoldov will stand in front of his commanders with tears in his eyes and report that 37 guards division, 10,000 strong, no longer exists. This is Stalin. The night witches fly an aircraft that has a top speed of 87 miles an hour. German fighters routinely come very, very close to 400. They operate mostly at night because they can't afford to be seen in the daytime. They operate quite low. The biggest danger, according to many of the veterans, is that uh, when they drop their bombs, they're so low that if they don't push the stick forward a little bit, They'll go up in the fireball. The, uh, the absolute veterans among this group tend to attack on the glide. They shut their motors off, rise just a little bit, drop their bombs, and try and get out of the area before the fire catches them. That, ladies and gentlemen, is, is their combat vehicle. The Fo-2, better suited for the uh, First World War than the Second. Casualties among these women extremely high. Valor among these women is unbelievable. Of all the units that uh, will be granted medals for individuals who are acknowledged as heroes of the Soviet Union, this single unit will have some 30, no, they will have 24 of the 33 that are granted to women. 24 of the 33 that are granted to women will come out of this individual unit. This is uh, Galina Markova. If you can take the uh, second figure in from the right, if you can take a look at that, and I'm sorry I don't have a better shot of that. I can't zoom it in for you. But just the strength of these women's faces. This is an actual combat shot taken uh, after, shortly after Stalingrad in a battle that came to be known as uh, Kuban. That's the PE-2, I won't say a whole lot about it, except it's one of the most advanced airframes of its day. It's terribly fast for a medium bomber. Men had a hard, hard time flying it. Women had such a hard time flying it that quite often the female pilot would have to have another crew member climb into the cabin with her to help her pull the stick back just to get this thing into the air. Once in the air, uh, the ladies who operated it, like this one, this is Marina Domina. Domina survives the battle. But look at the chest. She survives the war, but look at the chest. This, this is one of the, uh, the non night witch heroes of the Soviet Union. She's roughly 23 years old at the time. She eventually becomes a uh, co commander, the, uh, what do you call it, uh, second in command of, a, uh, of an air bomber regiment. The woman I would not want to meet, Valentina Grisibubova. Grisibubova is the only female member of a 300-member all-male combat unit. They are day bombers, special missions.
special mission personnel. They operate quite often behind German lines on the ground. But her job is to keep the aircraft in the air and deploy. She is indeed the commander of this unit. She serves as its commander for the entirety of the war. It is one of the most celebrated individual units in Soviet air history. Rizinupova goes on to be one of the founders of Russia's Aeroflot airline. The men who served under it used to call her the Lady of Steel. I think you can tell from that face, she was probably a bit injured. This is, uh, you've heard of the American A-10, the tank buster. This is the plane they robbed to design the Thunderbolt. This is the Il-2, the Illusion-2. Heavily armed aircraft, uh, the uh, pilot sits inside of a metal tub, much like the Thunderbolt. It has uh, on its wings two very, very formidable cannons. That's just another shot of it in flight. This is the woman who made it famous. That's Gorova, Anna Gorova, tank buster extraordinaire. Specializes in, in uh, developing tactics to uh, attack tanks on the move. The German advantage in uh, the Eastern Front was initially Type and number of tanks. Yugorova was part of the uh, solution. They came up with they call, with what they call the killing circle. She and others like her would uh, form a, a clover fleet, a four leaf clover, over an area that had tanks beneath them. And they would loop around inside these clovers, one on the deck while the others stayed a little bit higher to suppress fire. And uh, they began to cut away at, uh, at Germany's advantage in tanks. She's unfortunately shot down. She can't bail out of the craft. The old tube's hard to bail out of. She hits the ground with a plane. She breaks her back. She breaks her shoulder. She breaks both her legs. She's captured by the Germans. They put her in a concentration camp. The Russians liberate the concentration camp. They put her in prison. If you go missing in a Russian unit during the Second World War, and they don't know where you are. When they find you, they consider you an enemy. So, hmm? They're nuts, okay? She spends months being interrogated by her own side before they finally realize that this is indeed Major Yagora. This is the tank killer. She is eventually awarded hero of the Soviet Union status. I think she might say she paid quite a bit for it. These women, uh, I'm going to get Christina to help me actually come up with identities for them now. I think I'm, a, I'm kind of close to them. Once again, look at the text. Nice clusters of metal. They are all survivors of the Battle of Kuban. We are Americans. We have no idea what the Battle of Kuban was. At Kuban, the biggest aerial combat in human history took place. There's never been anything like it. There's been nothing like it since. Thousands of aircraft engaged in great big cat fights. These are some of the victims. This is another wave of aces. Didn't know when we could do any of this stuff, did we? It's a T-34 tank. It's an interesting vehicle. Uh, every modern tank that exists today owes a little bit of its, uh, its lineage to the T-34. It's this, the slope. Prior to the T-34, all tanks had flat faces. The Germans designed, uh, the Russians designed the T-34 to, uh, to have a slope face so that uh, many of the impacts against it would slide. If you look carefully, you see even the outer edges of the chassis are slightly sloped, meaning strikes there will slide a bit. The Germans quickly recognized that this was a superior vehicle. In fact, they did their best to capture these things intact so that they could repaint them and put the swastika on them and use them against other T-34s. For a while, the only way to knock out a T-34 was to be in a T-34. 
but uh, the D-34 is easy to produce. It, it, it proved by German standards. So they were made by the uh, tens of thousands. This young woman, Guria Chahikova. Chris is helping me figure out exactly who they are. This one, uh, this one's actually uh, very, very new to me. She, she apparently uh, takes over her tank company when her commander is killed. She, uh, in, in one little blurb that we found on, she actually stayed on the battlefield, stayed in the battle, and if I'm remembering this correctly, she stayed in the battle when the tank was burning. The vehicle is on fire. Any tanker will tell you when, you, when, you, when, you, when your boat is burning, you really need to try and get out of that. She instead stays inside the vehicle and continues the battle. She dies just a few days before the end of the war. But she dies on the outskirts of Berlin, which is a long way from Russia teetering on the brink of destruction at Stalingrad. Oh, it's almost over. It's almost over. When the Soviets took the Reichstag, they actually, uh, when the Reichstag represents the heart of, uh, of Hitler's government. What we don't talk about is that uh, when Roosevelt and uh, Churchill decided at Yalta that uh, they would split the world with, with the Russians. One of the things that they also decided, pretty much, it was later confirmed by, uh, by General Eisenhower, they decided that the uh, Red Army would take Berlin. There were two reasons to make this decision. Practically, there was nobody else going to They were going to be the ones to get there first. It was clear. They were going to beat everybody else to Berlin. So it, it was sort of ceremonial that we agreed. Eisenhower had no interest in attempting to take Berlin because he expected the casualties to be quite high. In the single battle for Berlin, Russian casualties number one half million. The single battle of Berlin, one half million souls. But in a final act of irony, on the day Berlin fell, the red to the Red Army, a soldier caused the message from a marble column in the heart of Hitler's fallen right eye. Sophia Kuntzevi, Russian daughter of a welder, came here and defeated the fascism. I think that's a very nice uh, twist for a regime that wanted women to be transported to it as slave laborers and whores. This, uh, this is a monument that was erected in 1987. I showed you sort of a shadowy drawing of a young woman. Her name was Lydia Vidyak. She began to fly when she was 20 years old in a combat capability. She was called White Rose of Stalingrad by the German, uh, by the uh, Russian forces because she had a white rose painted onto the nose of her yak. The Germans that flew against her called her the Tiger Lily. They called her the Tiger because she was absolutely fierce in mid act. This yak will accumulate a total kill of 15, which means she's an ace three times. She will take off from Kharkov in 1943. Witnesses will remember that she waves from the cockpit with a wounded hand. She will fly into the air. She will never be seen alive outside of the aircraft again. She will be seen two more times that day, though. One Russian pilot reports seeing her on the edge of a cloud field. Her yak is already burning. She is turning back so that she can bring her nose around to face the three Messerschmitts that are apparently on the tail. She will be seen again a few
few minutes later. Now remember, these aircraft are traveling at better than 300 miles an hour. She will be seen again by another Russian pilot from the distance. Still burning, yet now being swarmed by nine German fighters. The historian in me likes to leave Lityak's last few minutes questionable because we have different stories. Some things are consistent in the stories, other things are not. The poet in me likes to believe that yes, the tiger lily did lose her life or go to glory in any way you want to call it. This little slip of a girl probably did lose her life. How not? Her body was found in 1987 by, uh, well, her body's not found. In 1987, uh, a couple of uh, farm boys will try and dig a snake out of a hole with a stick. They see the snake go down the hole, they try to dig it out with a stick. They see the stick down in the hole, they jam it around, and one of them hits metal. They go and report it to their parents. The parents come back, dig a little bit. They uncover a bit of a fuselage. On this fuselage, there's painting that clearly symbolizes this is World War II vintage, and it's Russian. They call the authorities. They come out, they do an excavation of the site. They find that it is the remains of a Yak-1. It does indeed have a white rose painted on its nose. The wing of the aircraft is intact. It has been used as a roof for the remains of the pilot. The pilot is removed. The pilot is indeed by skeletal remains, obviously identifiable as a woman, small pelvic, small stature. Dental records, DNA, will eventually prove that these are the remains of Flight Lieutenant Lilia Lidia. She was at that point to be given status as a hero of the Soviet Union, and the members of her crew, those that flew with her, who are now in their age,
Hi, I want to do a little research. I'm just not sure of that. I'm still looking for part two. Part two? Yeah.